Guac it up. <laughs> Say that again. Guac, guac, guac it up. <laughs> All right, we're going to start. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Real Advice. Today, we are with Mr. William Tong, a phenomenal rock star agent from the city of Los Angeles, the Chinese food areas. The Chinese food areas. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The LA Times calls my home city, Arcadia, the Chinese Beverly Hills. There's a ton of amazing, amazing Chinese food in my area, so I figured I might as well Sam in the Chinese food area, just call it what it is. So if you actually look at a map, is there an actual Chinese food area yeah, so on the look, map? Look at Chinatown. It's not that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's everything I, east and north of Chinatown. Chinatown is basically right next to downtown. So for me, my area is downtown, north of there, and east of there. And when you go east of there, you find that a lot of Chinese immigrants have actually moved into the city over the last 30 years. And they've brought their culture, they've brought their food with them. Uh, really love the food part. So you can actually get down to the different provinces of China. So there's Beijing food, there's Shanghai food, there's uh, Sichuan, Sichuan food, um, there's noodles, there's rice, there's hot pot, there's dumplings, there's dim sum, there's barbecue, uh, charcoal barbecue, there's spicy food, there's not spicy You're food. You're making me hungry. There's glass noodles, there's pho, there's, it, uh, pho is Vietnamese, but just in the Chinese food alone, the list goes on and on. Sweet. Well, jumping right into it, I think it's very important and you're actually talking about it right now on actually being that niche finding that niche embracing it obviously and uh, claiming it for your own i think a lot of agents uh, that are out there are you know they want to claim an entire county you know an <laughs> entire state <laughs> what would your your piece of advice be to that let's say somebody's out there advertising hey i'm i'm new to real estate and i'm x agent which as you and I know, is one that's impossible. But two, in their eyes, they think, oh, you know, the broader, the better, because I have a better chance of getting clients if I work an entire state. What, what would your piece of advice be to somebody doing that? When I first started out, I, was, I worked a really, really broad area. And I think a lot of agents do as well, just because business is so few and far between that they work as hard as they can on the leads and the business and the clients that they do get. But in the long term, their business would actually suffer. Because if they can start building relationships as soon as possible with people in areas that are adjacent to the areas they're familiar with, then by making those relationships, they can refer to those agents and those agents ideally would reciprocate and refer back. So for me, I always try and have a collaboration, sharing, cooperation mindset. And if those agents, when they first start out, if they have a lead in an area that they're not familiar with, they find the best agent in that area who is open to sharing, who is collaborative, who is a good person and honest and a hard worker, refer to that agent, refer to that agent all day. Because in the future, when that agent has a client for your area, the idea is that they'll refer it back to you. So I think in the long term, building these strategic relationships is much smarter than trying to work a really broad area. You know, you can be a one-man army or you can be a team. And they always say that two people together who collaborate well will always achieve more than one person alone. Got it. So it's not about competition. It's not about looking at the neighbor that is not only in your office, but the neighbor multiple cities away and say, hey, no, I don't want to work with those people. I want to do it on my own. I want to drive three hours this way, two hours <laughs> back this way. Like I can do it. I can do that. I can do it. I'm going to be the best. You know, no, no, don't work with them. You know, you know, they're four hours from me. I can totally do that. Like that's not the way. Well, if they are driving two to four hours, I hope they're listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it doesn't make sense because the two, four hours that they spend driving back and forth let's say they go on five showings, that's anywhere from 10 to 20 hours. That time could be much better spent farming and working on their home areas and mastering their market. So until an agent has 50, 60, 70% market share in the market that they're in, it doesn't really make sense to expand to areas that they're not that comfortable with. Lock down your home area first. I think that long-term is much smarter. Sweet. Well, we jumped right into a question, but uh, for everybody listening, why don't you tell us a, you know, a few sentences about yourself, who you are, what you like to do, uh, maybe what you don't like to do. I don't know. Sweet. You said I'm a rock star. I'm actually just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't jamming out when, when we started playing the music? I loved like, it. It was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. Yeah, the music, super awesome. Love the intro. Very, very classy. Very, very trendy. Very hip, which is everything you embody. Very innovative. I love it. Love the music. 
in terms of basically me, I'm just a, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy trying to work hard, trying to succeed, set up a good foundation for himself and his family, so that in the future they don't have to worry about money. Money is not what I'm looking for, but I need to work hard so that I can be successful, so that we don't have to worry about money. So that's one of the main things that I'm trying to do, which is to work as hard as I can to accomplish as much as I can, so I can lay down a foundation of success for myself, for my family, for the people I work with in the future. My ultimate goal is to help as many people as I can grow their businesses. Um, I was mentored by the amazing Andy C, one of my mentors. He basically shared with me that the more people that you help, the more that it will come back to you. And that's something that I've always believed, but to have someone to be able to articulate it who is so successful on that level and continuing to up his game is just for me very inspirational. So I want to be able to share as much as I can. I want the people around me to be as successful as possible. The more successful they are, the more they learn, the more they grow. Hopefully, the more they can teach me, the more I can grow my own business. What about your personal side? Um, as far as, you know, what is it that you like to do hobby-wise? Um, sure, sure. I, I like to do pretty much everything. Snowboarding, surfing, basketball, rock climbing, indoor rock climbing. I love to eat, love board games, love puzzles, love hanging out with friends, love movies. A lot of things. <laughs> I think a lot of people, they get caught up in the business, business, business. Whether you're Indeed. brand new, whether you've been in it for... 5 billion years, it's, it's business, 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 and then life, whatever is left. Hey, you know, work, 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 work. <gasps> I get it. I get a break, you know, and then they Agreed. take a break and then they go back into this like long grind and hustle and all these other words that you hear out there. What is your perspective on, on those people that are putting their life and their personal aspects and their hobbies and the things that they like to do outside of business? They're putting that to the side. What, what would you say to those people? There has to be a balance. Otherwise, you burn out. I've burnt out many times. And then to recover from a burnout, you actually waste more time than if you had just planned recreation time and planned a vacation, planned something ahead of time. So there are times now where I can feel maybe I'm getting ready to burn out <clears throat> and then I'm going to take a couple of days or a couple of hours or half day and just basically chill out, relax, recharge, just so I don't get to the point where I'm out for a couple of days. So that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking to keep growing, keep progressing. So I definitely think that you have to have a balance. I, I, I met this one kid. He's only 19. He's full-time undergraduate school at UC Irvine. He loves real estate. He loves it to death. Like he loves doing open houses. He loves meeting clients. He loves being a multi-million dollar agent. And he's just dominating these agents that have been his market for 10, 20, 30 years because those agents see it as work, whereas he sees it as fun. So his full-time job is to be a student. For him, real estate is a side gig. It's a side hustle. It's very, very fun for him. So for me to see it from his perspective, it reminds me that we need to remember, find, identify the things that we love in this industry and then be able to really center our business around that. So if you think of this as a grind, as a work, uh, you know, as work, it's just going to be much harder. Glass half full, glass half empty type of thing. For me, my, I believe the glass is 100% full. Half full of water, half full of air, half plus a half is a full glass. And I think it's... Also very important that, you know, you said, hey, this guy is 19 years old. He's in school. He's got tons of things going on. <laughs> and a lot of people like to use excuses on why they can't do this, why they can't do that. Um, and then a 19 year old comes in and they're a top producer. And then it's like, well, how the heck is that guy doing it? You know, I've been I've been doing this and I've been doing that. and I've been doing this and blah, 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 blah. And I think the point that they're not realizing is, is that this business is I don't want to say basic, but this business can be easy if you're doing the right things consistently. You're not getting distracted. You're not, you know, trying to do this and trying to do that and trying to add this and trying to do all these different things. But, you know, that guy, whoever he is, is that I'm sure he doesn't have as much being thrown at him because he's also a full-time student. So he's like, hey, in order for this to, to work, I have X amount of hours, which are limited because I'm in school. So I have to do xyz in these hours and if i do that i make money where i think there's a lot of full-time agents who you know their calendar's open so it's hey i i do this and then i do that and then i fill this in and at the end of the day when they look at their business it's like oh crap i didn't actually sell anything i'm doing all these different things but it's not working and the reason is they're doing too much um what would you say is it what is that too much point for an agent when it's like dude don't try to add that like you're awesome at this why don't you just continue to do that you get what i mean does that make sense to you 
it, it definitely makes sense <clears throat> for me goes back to my personality my style i would love to be able to be the focus guy that plans it out that's very strategic but i'm more of a doer so i just do things <clears throat> and then as i've progressed and learned over the years i kind of just pick and lock down different things every year and then as i for example really get to learn and master and execute open houses as i learn execute expires agent to agent referrals uh, in, inter international clients as i lock these different things in i now have more time to focus on the things that i haven't mastered so i wholeheartedly agree with you that people need to be able to lock down and master certain pillars of lead generation as their foundation because if you don't lock one thing down then you have no foundation you're building a house on sticks and mud and that rarely <laughs> turns out well especially if a you know big bad wolf comes along <laughs> and you know blows your house down so you're 100% right people need to lock down certain pillars of lead generation once those are locked down then they can start exploring other things the classic mistake is that people before they have locked something down they think oh it doesn't work they quit on it and then they try and shift to something else so your perspective definitely you know really on point if it's not working for you figure out why isn't it working lock it down and then move on to the next one or once you have a lockdown make sure that you maintain it and then move on to the next one don't just move on if you haven't locked one thing down so for everybody listening what's one thing that's working for you currently one thing that's working for me pretty well is i would probably say open houses are working really well for me it calling expires open houses those don't, those don't work for anybody ah so you I'll, just sit there and you just stand and you just text people and four hours goes by then you go home and then you complain i thought open houses don't work this will be my gift to you and your audience <laughs> so i always say Open houses don't work if the agents don't work them. And and I believe me, I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> proponent in open houses. I think open houses are, are. are phenomenal. I think You're definitely for most people masters. that don't utilize them, it just makes the people that do look even better. So what, what would be a good piece of advice uh, for somebody that's planning an open house? That's, you know, they've already done open houses. Oh yeah, open houses. Yeah, those don't work. Waste of time. What's one thing that, you know, you can add to their toolbox and something to try to make it a little bit better next time. The most important thing is, is rapport building. So from beginning to end, whoever walks into that door has to trust you. If they don't trust you, if they think of you as a salesman, they're not going to believe a word you say. You have no leverage, no intellectual leverage. So you have to be able to build rapport. You have to be able to connect or at least just come across as nice and not offensive and not overly aggressive and not salesy and not pushy. So if, if I had to have you know, one piece of advice, one thing that's really important, learn how to build rapport. And let's say that I'm walking into that house and the agent or client or whoever it is that's walking into that open house comes in. Let's take a few steps back. What, what are you doing marketing wise? What are you doing advertising wise um, that may be different than somebody else that's advertising an open house or not advertising an open house. And what I really want to get into the fact is I know you do a lot of Facebook lives, um, whether it be at a specific event, whether it be going to an event, whether it just be in the Chinese food areas talking about different food. Um, how has Facebook live, you know, helped you in your business and, you know, been able to get you into a broader audience? Definitely. In terms of open houses, I'm going to have to listen to your podcast to get all the tips and tricks. <laughs> I don't have uh, any tips and tricks. I think most people don't utilize already for open houses. So, you know, Jonathan, you have amazing knowledge that you've put out there in terms of open houses. Um, it just really comes down to the classic stuff, making sure that the pictures look good, that you're telling the right people, telling the neighborhood, you know, that you guys have an open house and to try and welcome as many people to come by as possible. In terms of Facebook lives for me and social media, it just comes down to engagement. So, it's engaging the people that are in my network, that are my friends, that are my family, that are my clients, that are agents that I'm trying to help or that have helped me just so I can stay top of mind. And that whenever I'm producing something or whenever I'm about to start a Facebook Live, my perspective is always, if I was watching this, what would I think? Like, what, am I going to learn something? Is this interesting to me? So I don't, although I do a number of Facebook Lives, I try not to do it randomly. Um, I know that the idea is you just try and do as much as you can, but I think at this point, there's so many people doing as much as they can that it's diluting, um, you know, just people's attention. So I call it the attention economy. So for me, it's about trying to be on point as possible with my Facebook lives, try and keep it super short and just put stuff out there that I think people will enjoy and that people will like. 
But at the same time, I'm no expert in social media. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just putting Facebook lives. Out there. So if you learn anything, let me know. Try and get that. I'm going to do a 180 here because I know you're super passionate about this topic. So I'm going to give you the platform to talk to all of the real estate agents that are going to be listening to this podcast um, on an organic scale. And as I push ads in front of them, so that way they'll hear this. So that way you can get your message to even more people. And this is going to go into the commission debate. Mm. And this is something that I know you and I have <laughs> talked about. Uh, we've had it, you know, discussed at dinners and on a ship in the middle of the ocean. It gets heated. And it gets heated. It gets heated. I'm and, very passionate and about my value. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, lead into it saying that William is very strong in the fact that he thinks that agents should be taking X amount of commission. I'll let you obviously talk about it more. And that it's something that, uh, you know, taking lower commissions and offering lower commissions um, to your cooperating brokers is something that's drastically hurting the market and something that has definitely taken effect here in Los Angeles to where the norm now becomes something that's lower because, hey, this is what other people are doing. And we've kind of gone away from what we would consider a full commission because the mindset of most agents is I go in and I ask for X and then I usually will give X or, hey, if I can make more, then I can give this person. So why don't you go into depth a little bit more about that? And you can speak directly into the camera when you are, are, are giving your plea to agents to stop taking lower commissions, one, and stop offering commissions, um, lower commissions to cooperating brokers. I would say you're really putting me on the spot, making me sweat, except there's a camera right there, so they see I'm actually not sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty cool and calm guy. Um, 90% of the time. Until we talk about this topic. <laughs> no. <laughs> so yes, we have had many conversations about it. We obviously can't talk about the actual numbers for antitrust reasons. For me, it's not so much a full, quote unquote, full commission. It's whatever commission agents are worth. So as an agent, if you're really specialized, you're really good, you're really trying to protect your client. Do you add more value than that X percentage of commission that you're asking for? It's kind of like when you have a job and you're salaried, are you adding more value to the company than what your salary is? Because if you're not, then you're probably going to let go. But if you're adding the value, then it's awesome that you're there and you're contributing to the company and to the success of everyone on the team. So when it comes specifically to commissions, are you as an agent contributing the value that you are asking for? I think in this industry, the majority of agents are not. And that's why there have been a number of discount shops that have come up, 100% commission brokerages where some agents in these brokerages on their signs, they advertise X percentage commission that is significantly below what everyone else is charging. If everyone else is doing their work and you break it down to a per hour basis, <clears throat> there simply is not enough time and money that is being contributed to the deal to have a good outcome for the seller. Because a lot of agents have automated so many things that they just kind of put it onto the back burner. They hope the buyer's agent comes along, brings a buyer, and then they just go ahead and get their listing side commission. So as they have done less work, they're now willing to take less money. So I think that on an industry scale, as agents have stopped improving and have gotten really lackadaisical, for lack of a better word, lackadaisical, lack of a better word. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> My jokes are terrible. <laughs> I, I readily admit that. So in this industry, as agents have stopped specializing and stopped improving and stopped adding, adding value, the commissions have come down. But in terms of me and my transactions, there have been multiple cases where I sell properties for more than an agent or company that had been hired previously, or I'm selling for higher than the appraised value, the appraisal ideally being an independent third-party analysis of a property and what a fair market price should be, or I'm selling it significantly higher than what the seller was asking for. So for me, it's simply a case where I work extremely, extremely hard to have better results, better performance, higher net value, whatever it is, more than they would have had with 99.99% of other agents and other companies. So in a market where we're starting to see commissions start to trend downward, I'm actually trending upward. And it's not like I'm trying to take more money from my sellers. I'm, I'm adding significantly more value than other agents on a net like perspective. I'm netting my clients more and I have multiple cases to show this. 
So this is what I show to sellers in listing presentations. Here's a property that was listed by another agent, two months, three months, no offers, no sales, multiple price reductions. Here's my property, my marketing. Here's my strategy. Here's how I sold it for more than the other agent. It's black and white. It's numbers. So to wrap that up, what you're saying is agents are ask, asking, excuse me, for X commission. And hopefully that's what we would consider a full commission. That the issue with what happens after is that too many agents have gotten relaxed over the last few years. They've gotten comfortable with just signing a listing agreement, taking a few photos on their iPhone and then putting on the MLS and then it sells with multiple offers, which we're not seeing as much currently that, Hey, in order for us to fully get what we deserve, we need to go above and beyond. And look, somebody could go somewhere else and they can get that discount and they can try and save money in their eyes. And yeah, they're definitely going to do that if the agent that's sitting across from the table was going to offer the exact same thing that that person does and that company does. But when we can get the audience and our clients and everybody to see that, hey, working with an agent, not only are you going to get X, Y, Z, you're going to get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, you're going to get all these different things and look at all the different benefits that you get while working with us. And what agents need to realize is that, look, the, the moment that you take a lower commission, you're hurting your fellow brother and sister to the left of you because that's now the norm. Hey, no, that's what this person does and they do X, Y, Z for me. That's what this person does. They do X, Y, Z for me. But if you stand your ground and you perform, you provide that value and then you go even higher than that, then everybody's going to see that, hey, one... Yes, they took a higher commission, but two, which is most important, I made more money. And the reason that they made more money is no robot, no piece of technology can absolutely take away that agent to agent interaction, that personal relationship that an agent can provide. What what are your thoughts on on that? So it definitely overall aligns with my perspective, except for the part about the money. Because for me, it's it's sincerely not about the money. It's about about the money for the for the client. Oh yes, okay. The then, net to them. Then I retract my <laughs> almost. It is line. about the money. <laughs> how much money you're making for them? Exactly. Yes. Because for a lot of our sellers, especially in your market and my market, this could be the last large asset that they ever sell in their lives, and it's been the case for me multiple times where they're retiring, and this is the last house they're going to sell. They're going to move into the next place, and that's going to be it. So every single dollar extra that I can get them more than another agent would have. This is one extra dollar they have in their nest egg, in their retirement for the rest of their lives. So for me, it's deeply, deeply personal that I'm able to get my clients as much money as I possibly can. So overall, I'm a very nice, friendly guy 90% of the time, but there's that 10% where I can get really mean. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, the do 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 That's a scary sound. <laughs> That's my 10%. That's my 10%. So yeah, next time my 10% comes out, I'm going to play that sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's one parting word of advice that you would give somebody who's been in the business for a while and they're now realizing that, hey, just being average is just not working. I'm not selling as much. I'm not doing as much. The last few years were great, but now, crap, I got to do more. I got to work more. I actually have to schedule and prospect and do all these different things that I hear top agents are doing, now I need to do those. What's one piece of advice that you would give that agent, just one thing that they can do today that is gonna help them uh, in their business? The best piece of advice I can say is keep learning, keep growing. Try and seek out people who are succeeding in the areas that you wanna be successful in. See what it is they're doing, ask them to mentor you. People aren't gonna mentor you for free, they're not gonna mentor you just because you asked. You have to work hard, you have to add value to them. So do whatever it is that you can to help them grow their business. And then ideally it's reciprocal and they're going to help you grow yours. So always learn, always improve, always grow. Because if you're standing still, you're going to get left behind. And going back to all those agents that kind of have just let themselves become average and have stopped growing to them, I would say get better or get out. I like it. <laughs> get better or get out. Thank you so much for being with us again, William Tong from Los Angeles, California. William, where can people find you on social media? 
People can find me at G-L-I-F-I, at Gliffy. You can find me on Facebook if you search for William Tong. If you don't see my picture, just search for William J. Tong, uh, all one word, and I'm going to pop up right there. On LinkedIn, I'm William Tong. I don't use it at all. It's a graveyard. But like a zombie movie, I'm going to have to revive that. William <laughs> Tong, Los Angeles, and Chinese now we rock out. Areas. Chinese food areas. <laughs>Hey everybody, this is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment, shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.